I'm delighted to bid you welcome to the sixth and final lecture of our ancient attire lecture series this uh, term. Um, it's very, very nice uh, to see you here. Um, and it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker this afternoon. Um, our speaker is Dr. Salvatore Gaspar. He's a senior researcher in history of the ancient Near East and Semitic philology at the University of Padua in Italy. Um, Dr. Gaspar or Salvatore's research focuses on the history, administration, religion, and material culture of first millennium BC, Assyria. Among many other exciting texts, Salvatore is the author of the book, Textiles in the Neo-Assyrian Empire, a study of, termino of terminology. It was published by de Gruyter in 2018, and I think it will be of particular interest for uh, participants in this seminar. Uh, this book is an investigation of the textile terminology attested in Neo-Assyrian texts and in the role played by textiles in the economy, administration, royal imagery, and religion in imperial Assyria. Uh, Salvatore has um, been all over Europe uh, doing research. He's been in Helsinki, he's been in Heidelberg in Germany. He's also been in Copenhagen at the Center for Textile Research uh, from 2013 to 2015. That was where I had the pleasure of meeting him the first time and where I started uh, following his research. Salvatore's lecture this afternoon is called Dress, Adornment, and the Material Language of Power, Royal Textiles in Assyria. And Salvatore, I'm just going to unpin myself and put a pin in you. Okay. Um, <laughs> if I can manage that somehow. Can you see? Yes, it looks great. Oh, and yeah. I just need to make sure that we can all see you. There. And then Salvatore, thank you so much for being here. It's really, really nice to have you with us. And the Zoom room is all yours. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here at the Ancient Attire Lecture Series of the Faculty of Theology of the University of Oslo. And I'd like to thank Professor Anne Katrin de Hemmer Goodman for inviting me to this uh, seminar. The history of Assyria in the first millennium BC offers a good example of the connection between textile art and power. In this period, the land of Ashur, the Assyrian Empire, achieved unprecedented hegemony over most of the Near East. As an integral part of Assyrian imperial culture, textile art represented one of the media through which the ideas of the universal power of the Assyrian king and the God-inspired mission to rule the world Within, were spread within the Assyrian court and the large class of high-ranking state officials. The large demand for luxury textiles by the Assyrian ruling elite who governed Assyria between the 9th and the 7th century BC primarily concerned lavish items of clothing to be used by the king, the queen, members of the royal family, and high-ranking state officials. Since the beginning of urbanization, Mesopotamia had been a walled country. Its textile manufacture was predominantly based on the utilization and processing of wool, while linen had always been used to a more limited degree. In addition to wool and flax, in the first millennium BC, cotton was, was another fiber used for elite textiles in Assyria. Understanding how technically the Assyrian royal and queenly garments were made by textiles, textile craft people is difficult, principally because of the partial invisibility of textile materials in the archaeological evidence of the Mesopotamian alluvium and of our ignorance about the textile technology of that historical period. However, the meager evidence about the remains of fibers and woven textiles from first millennium BC Assyrian sites is compensated by legions of textual data from archival cuneiform tablets regarding the textiles produced and consumed in Assyria. In addition, Assyrian visual art encompasses a large number of uh, fine executed artifacts from sculpted stone uh, reliefs from royal palaces to cylinder seals, which, thanks to depictions of the elite and especially royal garments in profane and cultic scenes, 
help to integrate the pieces of information, material, and textual nature about the Assyrian elite textiles of the imperial age. The picture that results from all this data can help us form an idea of the Assyrian manufacture of expensive textiles, an industry whose evidence has not survived archaeologically, apart from, apart, uh, from some um, rare finds. So in this contribution, I shall briefly reconsider royal clothes and the possible meanings attached to them uh, to show uh, how dress and dress related um, adornment, which are the uh, topics of our seminar, uh, represented a sort of material language of power in, in Assyria. I will focus on these aspects, dress and adornment concerning the king's clothes and dress and adornment concerning the queen's clothes. Dress and adornment play a crucial role in establishing personal and social identities in the Assyrian royal milieu. Both these elements concur to create the outfits of kings and queens and to materialize the unrivaled power, wealth, and divine protection of the Assyrian Empire. In its basic components, the king's dress is defined by a long fringed robe with short sleeves and a fringed overgarment or shawl that covers the king's shoulders or that could be wrapped around his body. In visual representations, the Assyrian monarch also wears a truncated tiara with long ribbons. These basic components of the royal dress could be finely decorated by ornamental designs, both, both figurative or geometrical. Decorative elements are documented in numerous palace reliefs, monuments, paint the wall panels, and minor art objects and represent an important source of information for New Assyrian royal clothing. In addition to the different components of the king's dress, the significance attached to the wear is also conveyed by the borders, bands, and fringes of the royal garments, the decoration of these garments. In the display of the royal dress in Assyria, we see not only the function of dress as a marker of identity, but also the role of royal clothes as a medium of communication of what characterized the message of dominion of, in imperial Assyria. The political significance of displaying the royal dress as a means of conveying the idea of Assyrian power to the country's uh, subjects is especially evident in monumental art. In this context, garments seem to have played a role as a manifesto, to use an Italian word, a manifesto of Assyrian royal ideology, a communication means, analogous to other material vectors of political religious communication. Within the Assyrian mindset, kings enjoyed a special proximity to gods, and this special relationship was stressed through the non-verbal language of textiles. The visual art of Assyria shows that the types of garments worn by the gods and kings, as well as decorative elements that adorn them, share the similar characteristics. Function and meaning probably varied according to the specific garment worn by the king. We can imagine that the royal wardrobe included costumes specific to private and public audiences, public ceremonies, religious events, war and hunting activities. Although the details of all these items are difficult to identify. An analogous semantic variability was probably conveyed by the specific attributes of garments, primarily color, structure, and decorative designs, which were probably crucial to materializing ideas, such as the superior status of the Assyrian king, his proximity to the divine sphere, not to speak of his personal abilities and the prerogatives attached to the Assyrian royal institution he embodied. Generally, the long tunic and the overgarment are peculiar to ceremonial and ritual scenes, while in hunting on war uh, scenes, the Assyrian king wears clothes that on one hand seem to distinguish him from his military entourage, and on the other hand, seem to recall elements of the military dress, possibly to emphasize his warlike capabilities. An example that I have in mind is the cavalryman tunic with a slanty edge, 
in horse riding scenes of room S of the North Palace in Nineveh. Possibly this scene recalls the period of training when Assurbanipal was a crown prince. The presence or absence of certain items of royal clothing in visual art are probably an indication of how the royal outfit was determined by the specific context of use and of the meaning that these items had added to the royal dress. For example, we have a, a attestation of the lack of the tiara in status of, for example, Asurnaz II and Shalmaneser III. Status uh, which, uh, which uh, uh, were erected in cultic places or which were dedicated to the uh, gods. Possibly the lack of tiara is, uh, was a sign of respect towards the deity. Regarding the overgarment, it seems that the type of uh, shawl and the way it was worn served to communicate the superior status of the wearer in comparison to, uh, to his uh, subjects. Interestingly, the fringed overgarment, which is a peculiar element of the Assyrian royal dress, is not present in scenes from the North Palace in Nineveh that represent at Assurbanipal. In non-ceremonial events, such as the one carved on a wall panel from the North Palace and depicting the so-called royal picnic in the uh, Ninevite garden, um, Assurbanipal wears only a plain tunic Probably this uh, uh, situation is uh, due to the private and unofficial context of the event represented. Surprisingly, also in ceremonial context, a Surbanipal's dress doesn't include the shawl. In fact, in the scene of the libation ritual on the dead lions that follows the successful conclusion of the royal hunt in the North Palace of Reliefs, the king wears uh, the royal tiara and the ceremonial long robe but no overgarment is represented in this ceremonial scene. Equally interesting is the presence of the diadem, typical of the crown prince, of the crown prince's attire, instead of the truncated royal tiara, in also in scenes where the wearer is clearly the king, such as the aforesaid the royal mill seen in the palace garden. To judge from the fine and complex decorations that adorn the clothes of the new Assyrian kings, especially in the headband and ribbons, chest and sleeves, and the garments border in representations on palace reliefs, a special emphasis was put on a certain figurative and symbolic element, in all likelihood related to the Assyrian concept of kingship and its role. Here you can see the parts of the royal garment in uh, Ashurnazi II reliefs, uh, which are the main parts decorated with uh, both geometrical and, uh, in this case, uh, figurative more than geometrical elements. Um, for instance, on the garment of Ashurnasli Pal II, the decoration uh, is a replica of motifs carved on the stone wall panels of the Northwest Palace in uh, Kalku, and shows how the king's political message was spread through different visual media that worked as a single component of a, of a unique integrated visual system. For example, we can see the king facing the so-called uh, the so-called uh, Assyrian sacred tree, the wind uh, and, uh, symbol of the god Ashur and protective genies along with sphinxes and vegetal motifs. In this case, you can see uh, the chest area, the chest part of uh, Ashurnazi uh, uh, garment, and uh, here you can see the dress decoration on uh, the shoulder. I isolated just a few of these uh, uh, motifs. Um, all these elements are peculiar to, uh, of his uh, robe. The motif of the winged hero wrestling with wild or supernatural beasts also occurs in this uh, iconographic repertoire. All these motifs illustrate the basic concept of the Assyrian Roy ideology through symbolic imagery, from the priestly office of the king and the vice regency with the god Ashur to the, to the ruler's divine mission to extend the country's borders as a reenactment 
of the victorious deeds performed by the god against the forces of chaos in the combat myths. Not to mention the vitality of the vegetal world, a possible allusion to the prosperity guaranteed by the God-inspired governance of the country conducted by the Assyrian king. Looking at the Assyrian royal art from the early to the late Neo-Assyrian period, it seems that the royal tastes for decorative patterns of garments changed slightly over time, since uh, differently from the textile decorations of Assurnazipal second period, the kings of the eighth and seventh century BC wore clothes whose decorations uh, predominantly, if not exclusively, consisted of geometrical elements, including motifs that could adorn both the borders of garments and their main surface, such as concentric circles, square-shaped elements, rosettes, and star-shaped motifs, which were especially studied by Guralnik, um, but also uh, Brigitte Lyon. <clears throat> In addition, these uh, geometrical patterns were also replicated on uh, tiaras, <clears throat> sorry, on tiaras and royal parasols, namely in all the royal accessories and paraphernalia that materialized the environment in which the royal person was displayed in the public. During the Sargonid period, especially in the reign of Assurbanipal, concentric circles with central dots, encircled rosettes and stars were the preferred motifs in decoration of royal garments. Yeah, you can see just uh, a scene from the Khorsabad Palace reliefs showing uh, uh, Sargon II and uh, possibly um, uh, the Crown Prince with the garments uh, completely uh, decorated with uh, rosettes, um, both the main uh, tunic and the uh, overgarment. In scenes uh, carved on palace wall panels uh, of the reign of Assurbanipal, the emphasis on the finely decorated king's dress is also stressed by the evident contrast between the royal robe and the completely undecorated clothes of non-royal individuals of his close entourage. A peculiar element in Asurbanipal's royal dress, uh, unfortunately I have not included in the slide, but I, I will describe the, here this uh, element. Uh, a peculiar element in Asurbanipal's dress is visible in the hunting scenes. The chest area of his garment shows a rectangular shaped panel bordered by narrow bands with concentric discs and various motifs in the shape of rosettes, rectangles, lotus buds, and circles. A figurative scene with two images of the king facing the Assyrian sacred trees under the divine wind disc is represented inside this rectangular shaped element this chest panel, and witnesses to the reuse of a 9th century motif in the textile art of the late Neo-Assyrian period. Presumably, because of the religious meaning attached to the scene, to the Assyrian uh, sacred tree scene. In any case, geometrical elements dominate the decoration of the royal dress in the late Neo-Assyrian period. Some of these elements, namely stars, discs, and concentric circles, were probably intended to represent the Assyrian deities, the Assyrian gods, in astralized form. Presumably, these astral decorations were aimed at conveying the idea of the universal power and the universally spread power of the king, and that uh, this power and the country were under the protection of the uh, gods of the Ilani Rabuti, the great gods of Assyria. The context of uh, annual cultic ceremonies uh, in the holy city of Ashur, for example, the Shabbat Wadaru festive cycle and the Akitu celebrations, possibly represented the, the moment in which uh, the royal dress and insignia, I mean, uh, prim primarily the scepter, the staff, the ceremonial uh, weapons of the king, materialize the unity of the gods and the king's power and the unity of the, the empire, the, the land of Ashur. In this view, legions of stars and circles on the royal dress 
diffusely spread on the royal dress must have played a role in visually stressing that the king's power was universal, similar, but not the same, similar to the gods' uh, dominion on the whole cosmos. In addition, from a magic uh, religious uh, perspective, we cannot exclude that the all above discussed the dress decorations, both figurative and geometrical, were also meant as charged of the epotropaic function, an aspect already suggested by Peter Bartle and Brigitte Lyon. To close this part of my speech, I will just add the following uh, remarks. The richly decorated royal dress depicted in palace uh, reliefs illustrates the significance attached to the borders of garments and to specific elements of the decoration. In a world where garments were largely untailored, it was the specific combination of items of clothing, borders, border bands, and ornamental elements that define the identity of a garment, the identity of an outfit, and also the identity of the wearer. Patterned fabrics could be made of multicolored threads and possibly by embroidery, a technique preferred in the case of figurative representations, probably because it enables a higher degree of precision as suggested by Brigitte Lyon. Another way to create patterns was to attach precious stones and metal items to the cloth as evidenced by the queenly dress attachments that I will describe later. I'd like to focus now on dress and adornment in the queenly dress. Another type of evidence regarding the dress and ornament of the royal elite of the neo Assyrian period has been provided by archeological research on the burial sites of the eighth century capital of the Assyrian state, the city of Kalku. These findings enable us to reconstruct a more balanced and less keen oriented discourse on dress and adornment in uh, the first millennium Assyrian royal context. The discovery more than 30 years ago uh, of tomb two in the domestic quarter of uh, the Northwest Palace in Nimrud revealed numerous valuable grave goods belonging to two elite women buried there. One of these palace women is to be identified as uh, Yaba, the wife of Tiglat Pileser III, and the other as Banitu, the consort of Shalmaneser V, or Atalia, the wife of Sargon II. The tomb also contained the remains of linen and cotton fabrics. Evidently, the remains of the valuable vestimentary ensemble worn by the women or additional textiles that were piled up over their bodies when they were, they were interred. Perhaps also part of the queenly wardrobe or funerary gifts to the deceased. A large variety of small objects were discovered in uh, the tomb. This material included a huge number of tiny gold rosettes, star-shaped ornaments, circles, and triangles, to mention just a few of these uh, metal objects. The most attested items were gold elements uh, shaped as rosettes and stars. For example, more than 710 petaled rosettes were found among the decorative materials of tomb two. Other interesting golden dress decorations from these burials are presented by discs, wheels, hanging bowls, domed studs, decorated and plain donuts or rings. All of, the, all of these materials, all of these items were probably stitched onto the garments and headdresses of the two women. The richness of this material bears testimony to the fine work of the Assyrian textile craftspeople, as well as the aesthetics and power vision of the women belonging to the royal family in the eighth century BC. Given the huge number of the golden decorations, it's clear that the items in question had served to 
adorn various types of garments worn by the buried queens. Moreover, uh, some of the decorative patterns uh, represented in uh, mid century, uh, mid seventh century BC monumental art uh, may be compared with uh, these materials, with uh, the materials found uh, in uh, the queenly tombs in Nimrud. In the well known picnic scene of the Northwest Palace in Nineveh, Asurbanipal and his wife in the Balisharat are depicted in a relaxed and feasting atmosphere in the royal garden while enjoying the pleasures of wine and snacks served by female attendants. The queen is represented in the foreground as enthroned and wearing a mural crown. Two elements uh, that indicate her status uh, as the primary wife and mother of the crown prince. The queens were fundamental to sustaining the royal lineage of the Assyrian Empire. Although inspired by the attire worn, probably worn by the living queen, this representation also speaks of the social values attached to the role of queens in the Assyrian Empire. The richness of clothes, the ornaments and the jewels speak of the queen's social standing, wealth, dignity and power. Costly clothes and precious ornaments become a means to materialize the queen's membership to the court milieu and their role, especially in giving birth to male heirs. In addition, the fringed robe of the queen represented in the relief uh, is, um, appears as constituted by an overcoat, an overgarment, and a long high neck tunic showing the same decorative patterns, that's an overall decoration of circles distributed throughout the garment with borders and sleeves enriched by outline bands with rows or smaller circles, dots and stepped triangles. Circles, dots and stepped triangles, for example, represented along the border of the uh, overgarment. On a fragmentary steel from Assur, bearing a representation of the queen on the throne and an inscription that identifies the women as Libali Sharrat, the queen's fringed overcoat as an overall decoration of rosettes and an outline band with a row or smaller seven petal rosettes. The overgarment, in particular the overgarment, is another item that is also peculiar to the royal dress. In this case, the fringed shawl, this uh, uh, overgarment, probably underlined the queen's social status and power. In light of the dress decorations discovered in the Nimrud tombs, it is possible that the elements adorning the lavish clothes of a Surbanipal's wife, presented in the relief, consisted of analogous golden elements attached to decorative bands that were previously woven as separate parts. Regarding the other golden elements adorning the queen's dress as carved in the relief, it seems that the decoration of the bands bordering the overcoat and the tunic was enriched Sorry, was enriched by attaching small discs or golden domed studs, while the triangular decorations could have consisted of a variant of the golden triangle shaped appliques used by the Nimrod queens in the 8th century BC. The step of the structure of the triangles adorning the Balisharat's robe along the border of the robe could have been inspired by analogous structure that characterized the well known Mesopotamia temple towers. At least this, this could be an hypothesis, a suggestion. This motif could have been chosen by the palace tailors in charge of the queen's wardrobe for the special significance of the ziggurat as a symbol of Ishtar, a goddess whose cult was strongly promoted by the late Assyrian kings. The queen's attire could have been decorated in profusion with hundreds of these golden items, elements that gave her outfit the same luminescent appearance that characterized the gold-covered clothes worn by the cultic status of the goddesses. In all likelihood, these heavy garments 
contributed to the sensorial dimension that could be perceived in everyday life in Assyrian palaces with the radiance of gold objects and their jingling when the queens moved in the palace wing or participated during public official ceremonies. An aspect suggested by Ellison Carmel Thomason in a 2016 article on the sensescapes of a Syrian capital city, on the sensescapes that could be perceived in a Syrian capital cities. Seen from the point of view of a Syrian royal ideology, the king ruled the country as the vice regent of Ashur, of the god Ashur, the head of the Assyrian pantheon. According to the same ideological framework, the Assyrian queen would have represented the earthen counterpart of Mullissu Ishtar, the consort of Ashur, the wife of Ashur. As I discussed in, in my monograph on textile, textiles in the neo Assyrian period, probably the fine garments worn by the Assyrian queen were probably intended as an imitation of the richly adorned vestments that covered the status of the goddess in the Assyrian temples. And this reference, this allusion to the vestments of the goddess presumably acted as a powerful means to underline the power and prestige that Assyrian queens reached in the royal family and state hierarchy. In this pictorial context, the highly decorated clothes stress the so social position of the Assyrian queen in the court, not only in correlation to her powerful husband, but also in connection to other women of the court milieu who held lower positions in the royal family and palace hierarchy. We don't know how the dress varied within the queenly wardrobe. We also ignore whether differences existed in terms of attire and decoration among queens, for example, between the queen mother and the king's wife. And we also ignore if differences existed, we can suppose that existed, among other high-ranking princesses who lived in the Assyrian court. Such highly elaborate clothes, in any case, excelled in elegance and wealth. Such highly elaborated clothes that excelled in elegance and wealth possibly represented another powerful means of, of confirming the success of the imperialistic project through the display of costly materials. Presumably, these fine textiles also served to consolidate the Assyrian aristocracy's support for and participation in the expansionist project of the Assyrian rulers. In the aforementioned scene in the Ninevite royal garden, the vivid contrast between the highly adorned queen's clothes and the plain garments worn by the women of her entourage, as well as by the king, is striking. Evidently, the central position given to a Surbanipal's wife in this scene is illustrative of the high social and political position reached by queens in the imperial age. In the royal palaces, Assyrian queens lived in a domestic win reserved for women, where they had their own court and dependent personnel. Queens such as Mulissu Mukani Shatninua, wife of Sunazipal II, and Nakia or Zakutu, queen of Sennacherib, mother of Saraddon and grandmother of Surbanipal, were not only wealthy and authoritative figures in the royal family and the court, they also played an active and crucial role in the political and economic life of Assyria. Moreover, foreign princesses who entered the Assyrian court through marriage could become queens and acquire the high status among palace women, as the case of Yaba and Atalia, two high-ranking women of possible Levantine origin suggest. I come to uh, the conclusions. As vectors of social meanings, the above discussed items of royal clothing and the adornment uh, objects worked at the level of identity construction. I mean, identity construction of the individual kings and queens, and that of the ideological discourse of unrivaled power and wealth 
reached by the Assyrian Empire during its uh, acme, during its uh, maximum peak of uh, power of dominion in the near, near East. The ensemble formed by the royal insignia and the royal dress with all its decorative attachments materialized the Melam Sharruti, to use the Akkadian expression, the splendor of kingship. Melam Sharruti, which is, uh, for example, uh, used in a theological commentary of the New Assyrian period to describe the Ninur Ninurta as a celestial counterpart of the Assyrian king. So the, the royal dress and all these uh, um, accessories, paraphernalia and uh, uh, dress decorations materialized, uh, possibly materialized the, the splendor of kingship. And so alluding, uh, referencing to the um, Melamu of the gods. But it also referred, it also um, uh, had a connection with all the functions of the Assyrian kingship that were embodied in the person of the Assyrian ruler. If we look at what Assyrian kings state in their inscriptions, about the adornment of status of the gods, we can imagine that an analogous function was attributed to the items that adorned the royal figure. Accordingly, ornaments, jewels, dress, and power insignia, including uh, ceremonial weapons, that covered uh, the royal person were envisaged as objects befitting the king's power. These objects, these items, make his body shining like the sun and serve to show the awe-inspiring radiance of the king as a visual manifestation of his divine mandate to rule the land of Ashur. In the case of the Assyrian queens, the assemblages of ornamental items are illustrative of, the how, of how the dress and adornment were crucial to establish the royal, royal women's identities in the personal, courtly, and queenly spheres. As already observed by Amy Rebecca Gansel in her reconstruction of the queenly dress in light of all the Nimrud finds. Depending on, on the degree of mobility of queens inside the Assyrian palaces and their participation in official and public ceremonies, elements of their ensemble vestimentaire possibly convey the other meanings to those who interact with the queens. Above all, the centrality of the dynastic uh, succession, the stability of the uh, throne of Assyria, and the role of queens as a female counterpart of the Assyrian king, of the king's authority within the court and the imperial organization. Possibly, the queenly dress and relevant brilliant attachments and jewels were also functional to visually stress that the Assyrian queen represented the earthen embodiment of the divine qualities characterizing the goddesses who protected the king, the lineage, and the land of Ashur. If this interpretation is valid, the display of the queenly dress would have, would have balanced the predominantly male, warlike, and king-oriented imagery and political discourse of the time at least in specific social context of the Assyrian palace life. It is also worth noting that both the kings and the queens clothes replicate the decorative motifs, for example, circles, rosettes, stars, stepped triangles, and so on, that were diffusely spread in the interior of palace rooms. For example, wall painting decorations, in Tel Halaf, for example, or uh, on carpets, uh, on drapery and furniture. And this uh, contributed to creating the royal space uh, as a unique, uh, integrated, uh, and uh, material synthesis, uh, not only visual, but uh, in general material synthesis uh, of the wealthy, luxuriant, and powerful cosmos uh, ordered by the combined action of king and his divine protectors. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Salvatore. And please, uh, everyone, will you join me in a Zoom applause?
Thank you so much for a brilliant lecture. This was incredibly interesting. And now we have uh, time for, uh, for questions. And I'm just going to let us go into a gallery view here. And please, anyone who'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please go ahead. And we have Joanne Skorluk first, please. Um, basically, first and foremost, bravo. That was a wonderful lecture. It truly was. Um, I have two things to add, however. Um, one of them uh, supports your point about the, the queenly power, essentially. Um, I have heard it argued, and I can get the reference if you give me some time. It was at a conference, um, and I'd have to go through my notes and try to find it. But uh, that the actual, that they are embodying uh, God and goddess, but it's not Asher and Melissa, it's Nabu and Tashmetum that they are embodying uh, there. And that's important because we have a um, recitation for Nabu and Tashmetum in their encounter at a different time of year. This is in the fall, whereas the, the other one is in the, in the spring, um, in which Tashmetum basically uh, wheedles um, <laughs> her husband into giving her the power to be his counselor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, okay. that's very, very nice for, for your point about that. And uh, that was one one thing I wanted to tell you. Um, go with Nabu and Tashmeta because that that. Uh, this is the conference in Helsinki, right? Yes, right, right. Um, okay, my my husband is trying to see if we can find out at least who it was, okay. who delivered the lecture um, for you while while I'm talking. But but um, the other is that um, there is something which you probably don't know about um, that might seriously help in something you were desperate to do, and that's to figure out how they wove the textiles. There is something called the Arjan Tomb, which was published by Alvarez Mon, and it's, um, it, it's Elamite, basically, um, and in it, you have a bowl which has Assyrian motifs on it, and you also have garments preserved. Mm -hmm. And the garments mm -hmm. are cotton garments. They are- um, Katra, in Katra, okay. No, no, uh, no, this is Arjan. This is in Iran. Ah. Ah, in Iran, okay, okay. Ah, Arjan, right. okay. Arjan, Arjan, yes, okay. this is in Iran. Um, and they found textiles in the tombs and those are published by Alvarez Mon. Anyway, they are, um, they're cotton garments, they have fringes, they have embroideries and they have sewn on appliques. So um, you have actual physical textile. By Alvarez Mon. Yes. I think. Yeah. Ah, okay, he, yeah, okay. yeah, that's right. You need to because take a look. I, I quoted uh, some uh, studies by Alvarez Mon on Arjan site, but uh, I didn't go in depth uh, in a comparison with uh, the Neo Syrian uh, evidence. But it's a very, it's a very interesting, uh, challenging uh, uh, suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. T take a look at that because I said I, I have only, I didn't have time to go through that, but but the descriptions indicated that the garments that they have, these textiles they have, are very similar to the types of garments you're looking at on Assyrian reliefs. And as I said, there are Assyrian motifs on the bowl, the famous Arjan bowl, also. Um, so it's comparable evidence that you might be able to to seriously use for trying to figure out how they actually made the garments. Thank you very much for this suggestion. <laughs> yeah. Very, very challenging interest. Thank you. Because and at the moment we have a very uh, rare finds uh, from Nimrud uh, and uh, studied by Crawford, uh, but uh, they are very, very limited and meager uh, evidence uh, to uh, reach uh, general conclusions uh, on uh, mm -hmm. uh, technological aspects about manufacture, manufacture of textiles. Uh, uh, maybe the Iranian evidence uh, is uh, more uh, uh, illustrative, more clear cut. <laughs> I, I think I think it really should it should help because I gather that they're reasonably complete the garments enough so that you can tell that they were embroidered and had things sewn on them. So and with fringes at the bottom. So at least there's the sub substantial pieces of garments that are actually preserved in that in that. So anyway, as I said, I, I just sort of sniffed it into it. I discovered it because I'm interested in the bowl, but um, but he also talks about the textiles, which I found fascinating, but didn't have really time to look at. But but you can, because it's of interest to you. I, so. I'm very aware that uh, my observation, very few remarks on uh, dress, uh, royal dress and the queenly dress, uh, raise more questions than the answers, yeah. because uh, I started my uh, studies uh, and uh, focusing on the textual evidence of the terminology. And then I, 
I moved to comparing and try to get some uh, um, uh, conclusions also on the material yeah. evidence, but it's very, very difficult. <laughs> Yes, and a long time, and no. it's a project, which is why you put things forward so that people can give you helpful suggestions and, and send you in new directions. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I would like to actually use the privilege of chair here and ask a question myself, uh, which relates to what Joanne just mentioned about the the Arjun tombs, because she mentioned that the the material that the textiles were made of there are, was cotton. And, and uh, Salvatore, you also mentioned right at the beginning of your talk, actually, you mentioned that in Mesopotamia we have, um, or at least in, a, in, in the new Assyrian time, we have wool and flax being used. But then also, if I understood you correctly, from the first millennium BC, we also get cotton. Is, is that correct, that it, it's introduced in the first millennium, or did I misunderstand you? There are some remains of, uh, um, I mean, um, the remain, fiber remains uh, from Nimrud are uh, flax, linen, and there are some fragments, uh, elements of cotton. Uh, these uh, specimen were uh, studied um, in the 19, I quoted the uh, Crowfoot uh, study published mm -hmm. in Iraq, and also uh, another study uh, regarding uh, uh, laboratory analysis uh, conducted in Japan in 19, if I, I remember correct, and it was identified also some cotton. This is very interesting because uh, uh, we have uh, the, the well-known passage in uh, Sennacheribis inscription mentioning uh, um, uh, the wool bearing uh, uh, trees in, uh, in the Royal Garden of Nineveh. Um, I think that if a cotton uh, was used in Assyria, it was uh, um, very limited um, production uh, of the uh, cotton textiles was uh, very, very limited for some uh, elite uh, textiles. I presume that cotton was imported uh, maybe uh, through uh, Babylonia, but uh, I'm not an expert of uh, uh, cotton fiber, uh, but in any case, it's interesting to, um, uh, to discuss about uh, the presence, uh, the use of cotton, along with uh, flax and uh, wool in Assyria, uh, and to combine this uh, material evidence uh, to the uh, passage of uh, an, an inscription by Sennacherib of the use of uh, cotton. Mm. Yeah, he says they yeah. made garments from them. He actually says that they made garments yeah. out of them. The passage, yeah. Uh, that's actually in the passage. She mentions uh, uh, wool bearing uh, trees, and, the, uh, she, uh, and he also states that uh, Assyrians uh, move uh, with this uh, uh, fiber and uh, produce uh, this. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's very, oh, very interesting. fascinating. That, that's new to me. Did, does anyone um, venture to make a guess at, to, as to when cotton was introduced in Assyria? Is it possible to date that, or is that just do we know too little to do that? There is discussion about uh, um, the words used to define cotton. And mm -hmm. uh, I also mentioned in my book uh, this, uh, um, this uh, um, scholarly debate, but uh, I, it's not uh, clear um, if uh, how it was uh, called the cotton in Assyria. Uh, uh, but uh, these very, uh, very limited um, uh, attestations uh, uh, speak of uh, the use of cotton, maybe in a very uh, limited uh, um, context, uh, maybe yeah. for uh, in a, a combination with uh, uh, flax uh, for uh, elite, very luxury uh, textiles. But uh, we don't have uh, other uh, information, other pieces of information <laughs> from textile Thank sources. You. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, then Sarah um, has a comment. Would you would you like to ask a question yourself, Sarah? Sure. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Salvatore. That was a wonderful lecture. Um, my yeah. question is just about Labali Sharat's feet in the picnic scene. Um, I thought I saw some circles on her feet. I'm wondering if she, if you think she's wearing slippers, if you have thoughts on what those are made of, and whether or not uh, footwear at all plays a role in this symbolic uh, performance of power for neo-Assyrian elites. 
good question, <laughs> but I, I'm not uh, and go in depth uh, in uh, in um, decoration um, of sandals and and, and uh, footwear of the, the Assyrian period. I only focus on uh, on garments and dress and adornment. But I think um, the evidence of the um, sandals or footwear of the uh, Assyrian queen um, lead us to extend the discussion on the use of the same decorative motifs uh, also on footwear, not only on, uh, on garments, on uh, elite clothes. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, piece of information, uh, of evidence, uh, but I can use this uh, suggestion, your question, to, um, to extend uh, in the future this analysis also to uh, footwear. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Yeah, that would be great. I'd love to see more on footwear. Thank you. Thank Me you too. For, for your question. I, I noticed exactly the same thing about that relief, actually, as you did, Sarah. And also noticed that at least in the depiction, it looks as if the decoration on the garment is very similar to the decoration on the shoes. It's almost as if as if it's continuing. Um, and I, I don't know if that's supposed to to indicate some kind of similarity in material and decoration, or if it's just if it's just the way you do it when you make a, a relief. <laughs> At least from the aesthetic point of view, the combination of uh, decoration in the garment and uh, and uh, shoes show that uh, um, uh, the general concept design of the outfit and uh, in, encompasses uh, an, a specific decoration for the uh, overcoat and the uh, the long um, uh, tunic and uh, the the shoes that's very very interesting it speaks of and uh, um, speaks about the um, the royal taste for uh, um, uh, an harmonic uh, connection between decoration of the decoration of the shoes with the main uh, pieces of the garment absolutely so and such a it really communicates a sense of an outfit something that really goes together. Um, I have another question here from uh, Tina, uh, dear Christine Nielsen. Tina, would you like to, uh, to ask your question yourself? Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Salvatore, for a really fascinating talk. I'm completely new to anything which has to do with Assyrian uh, clothing and ornaments and textiles and so on. So this was really a fascinating introduction for me. Uh, I came a bit late into the meeting, so I'm, I'm a bit worried that maybe you've already said something about this. But in case you have not, <laughs> I will ask now. Because you know, for, I've often wondered when I've been looking at these um, Assyrian reliefs about what looks like a watch on the wrist of the people who are portrayed on the reliefs. The, the rosette-shaped yep. uh, ornament it, in the... Exactly. Yeah. Could you say something a little bit about that? I mean, what is it and what is the function of it? I think there is a, um, an example from the um, material evidence from Nimrud of this uh, um, um, bracelet, or, uh, bracelet with a rosette or star-shaped elements. I think it's a, a rosette. It's a... a an example of a bracelet from the New Assyrian period. I'm not an expert of, of gold uh, jewels, but uh, you can find uh, evidence both on the um, wall panels, uh, stone wall panels from palace reliefs, and also on the archaeological evidence of these uh, uh, jewels that adorn the, uh, the royal person. Uh, but the element, the motif of the rosette, you can find uh, uh, also in the wall panels, uh, in, uh, in the archaeological evidence. So it's a very um, diffusely spread um, decorative motif mm. in the New Assyrian period. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I was wondering also, Salvatore, um, you, uh, you mentioned how the the style of the kings changes a little bit um, during our period. So first, you know, you have some kings that seem to 
show a preference for the figurative decoration in their garments. And then we move on if I uh, to more sort of geometric patterns. So when when you notice this development or change at least, uh, do you think of it in terms of almost the development in fashion or style? Or do you think it's more a case of the personal taste and preference of the individual king? Maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, uh, we are not able uh, uh, to reconstruct uh, the story and uh, the development of uh, uh, tastes and uh, of aesthetics in the Neo Assyrian period. We, have, we, we just have uh, some attestations of certain elements. But in the case uh, uh, of the uh, motifs that decorated the dress of the uh, kings and queens, especially kings, um, we can see this uh, uh, special taste for figurative in Asurnazipar uh, period and geometrical in the late Neo Assyrian period. Um, it could be an, an example of a change in the in taste, but I also mentioned that in uh, the case of the uh, chest panel mm -hmm. uh, showing uh, the Syrian sacred tree, we can find that element both in the Asurnazipar period and in Asurbanipal period. Uh, maybe I reuse uh, a late Assyrian uh, reuse of a ninth century motif. Um, so for these uh, limited uh, um, aspects, uh, we can see that uh, there are some uh, um, uh, preferences uh, in, uh, in taste, in aesthetics uh, and uh, uh, of the uh, royal dress. But uh, uh, we cannot reach, of course, uh, uh, general conclusions on the development of uh, fashion and tastes uh, along uh, all the neo Syrian period. Ooh. But uh, they are, in any case, uh, very uh, interesting uh, aspects that uh, maybe speak of uh, uh, a development of taste in uh, the aesthetics of the uh, royal person, the royal dress. And but these are just my uh, remarks, my observations. No, absolutely. And, and I think especially uh, when we think of, uh, of your conclusion to your talk today and how the royal insignia and royal dress, how they communicate royal splendor, basically, and, and communicate royal power. It's, it's so interesting, although our um, material is limited, it's so interesting to, to sort of consider um, dynamics, both of continuity, uh, that you're building on a dynasty and, and sort of replicating aspects of dress and motifs that are known from before. And then also, of course, elements of uh, innovation and, and in a way, um, stylishness. Um, so it, I know I know it's not easy. It's not possible to answer that question at all. But it's it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating topic to to consider at least. I think uh, um, experts in uh, uh, monumental art of first millennium uh, can uh, speak more about these aspects. Mm. Uh, in, uh, for example, in uh, the comparison of. Uh, the royal image, the royal person, in how the royal person is represented in monumental art, but also in minor arts, uh, and uh, if changes uh, occur during the Neo Assyrian period. Uh, I mentioned before um, the um, diadem uh, yeah. worn by Asurbanipal, presumably when he was. Uh, Crown Prince, but uh, we don't have uh, um, final uh, um, conclusions on this aspect. But it seems that that uh, it's not just a, 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 a crown, but it's a diadem, a small band uh, on the um, on the head. Uh, so we have these uh, uh, limited elements in uh, the uh, pictorial evidence on the Assyrian period that suggested that possibly. Um, uh, there was a development, but uh, we can also imagine that uh, probably we lack uh, many contexts of use of these textiles. Uh, so my question is, uh, all uh, the um, crown princes in Assyria uh, wore uh, that diadem uh, or uh, um, uh, other um, uh, headbands, uh, mm. headdresses were used in the uh, early the Assyrian period and then in the late Assyrian. So uh, it's uh, 
plausible that uh, we don't know many contexts uh, of use and display of uh, all these uh, royal uh, dress uh, items. Yeah. Maybe this, this is the more uh, frank and uh, honest uh, answer <laughs> to this <laughs> limited evidence. True, honest is good. Uh, Grant Frame, you raised your hand, please go ahead. Um, yes, I was wondering, have you ever actually attempted to make any of these garments, the undergarments and overrobes and practice just to see how they work in practice and how effective or ineffective they would be with uh, restricting the movements of one of the arms? This is a good question uh, to, uh, to put uh, to a tailor maybe, <laughs> or an expert in uh, manufacturing textiles. Uh, but, but there it, uh, also it's also related to your question to more to costume history and costume studies uh, and uh, how to uh, imagine and recreate uh, um, garments that we only see on a uh, um, bidimensional uh, on the bidimensional level of um, palace uh, wall panels. Uh, or just mentioned in uh, inventory text or uh, other kind of inscriptions from the Neo-Syrian uh, uh, period. Uh, okay. I cannot, I, I, I didn't try to imagine or figure out how uh, these uh, um, items of clothing were uh, uh, physically um, worn. Um, because sometimes it, it's difficult from, uh, the monument, the uh, pictorial evidence to uh, get some uh, um, ideas uh, on how uh, they were worn. Of course, we have also round statues of Assyrian kings. Um, I remember Assurnazipal statue, which is a, a statue in round, a round statue. Uh, we can see in that case uh, how the overcoat uh, was uh, uh, was worn by the king. But in the case of uh, bidimensional, the bidimensional dimension of uh, uh, palace uh, wall panels, uh, it's uh, a bit difficult. <laughs> but I it's a good, it's, uh, a good question. <laughs> absolutely. I know, Grant, in uh, Greco Roman studies, there's been a lot of attempts done at sort of reconstructive uh, or experimental archaeology where, where garments have re been reproduced. But there, of course, there's a lot more textile evidence to work on as well, because you've found at least some textile remains and, and garment remains in tombs and funerary contexts. So, so, but I'm, I've never heard of anyone reconstructing a Syrian dress like that, probably because the, the textile remains are simply too scarce. Mm -hmm. um, that's my guess, but very good question. Thank you. Thank but you. I remember that uh, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, the Center for Textile Research, uh, uh, in some uh, proceedings of conference in the past, uh, some scholar tried to figure out how um, the clothes of Ishtar were made of and the worn. Uh, so I think I remember that there were some uh, some attempts uh, to imagine to figure out how uh, the Ishtar's uh, clothes uh, were made of and worn by the wearer. It sounds like a fun workshop. <laughs> Very uh, funny. <laughs> uh, Joanne, uh, would you like to to make a comment, or well, is this? Well, um, yeah, go I, ahead. I will. I, I will make a comment. I was actually trying to get my hand down at some point, but but ah, anyway, okay. I have something to say about the last the last bit. We saw a lecture. I'm sorry. I used to see so many lectures these days. It's hard to keep track of who said what. But but at any rate, there was an actual experiment done with a, I think it was the garments worn by these um, the, the, these little statues, you know, that, that mm -hmm. are put in temples. So that gives you some idea of what, what period you're potentially talking about. But, but at any rate, they actually made a reproduction of the garment, um, wove one themselves. And they then had a friend try on various uh, versions of this garment to see if they, folded the way that they fold are shown as folding on the actual statue and discovered then from that the way in which you actually had to have woven it in terms of like what the edge if you took the garment off what does it look like and it has to be a certain shape exactly in order to fold in the proper way it could 
couldn't be fake material. Even and and, and also material. you you could not use modern material. You had to use the actual wool of the original garment or it didn't work at all. You couldn't you couldn't get it to work if you used synthetic modern synthetic materials. So that there were two things. There have been some stem studies done, not on Assyrian garments, but but on on much a much earlier period, but it would be simpler. Reproducing an actual Assyrian garment might be a little bit um trying, shall we say? Somebody oh, would need please. to spend a couple of months on embroidery, and then there's a little matter of um, <laughs> sewing things on and you know, blah, 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 to, to get the final, the final effect. And and then you could play with it, but but uh that would be it would be difficult. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're approaching the end of our time, unfortunately, but we have time for one more question or comment uh, in case anyone feels they haven't had a chance. Then please let me know. Or comments or suggestions. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Anything you like. Um, And I think Joanne, your hand is still from before, right? Yeah, or... still from before. But okay. but I can, make, I can make one suggestion. Yes, is, please. Uh, go out and and uh, do some more research, and then in a year or two, um, come back and and uh, tell us what you found. How's that for a suggestion? Thank you very much for your comments and suggestion. <laughs> That's a wonderful idea. Well. Um, Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Uh, I can tell you that here in Oslo, while we've been talking, the snow has started to fall uh, silently and beautifully outside. Um, and um, as I mentioned in the beginning of our talk, uh, this is the sixth and final lecture of this lecture series, but we are planning to come back uh, in 2024 with another, uh, not ancient attire this time, but the next time it'll be ancient adornment. Um, uh, we were debating whether it should be ancient adornment or ancient accessories, but we've, we've landed on ancient adornment. So perhaps that's an opportunity to invite you back, Salvatore. Um, but um, for now, I would like to thank you very, very much um, for, uh, for your lecture this afternoon and for a great discussion. It's been uh, illuminating and it's been delightful. Thank you so much for sharing your research and your time with us. Uh, and thank you everyone for uh, for being here and I wish you uh, a happy holiday time in a few weeks and a very lovely weekend. Thank you so much. <laughs>